Welcome to our town hall, rolling up our sleeves with pride, the importance of updated COVID vaccines for LGBTQ plus health. This town hall is being recorded and you can turn on the closed captions with the CC button or at the more button at the bottom of your screen. We also have ASL sign language interpreters for our town hall today and want to thank them for joining us. A survey regarding the webinar will show in your browser as you leave the program today. Should you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A button to submit your questions. Questions not answered during the program will be answered and shared in a Q&A document on the SAGE COVID information page. It is now my honor to introduce our first speaker for today, Adrian Shanker. Adrian is Senior Advisor on LGBTQI plus Health Equity in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health at US, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Before joining the Biden-Harris administration, Adrian led LGBTQ plus community centers in Allentown, Pennsylvania and Marion County, California. Thank you so much, Adrian, for joining us today. Thank you, and uh, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the introduction, Cheryl. I'm Adrian Schenker, he, him pronouns, and I'm honored to serve in the Biden-Harris administration as Senior Advisor on LGBTQI plus Health Equity at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. By way of visual access, I'm a white man wearing a white shirt, gray suit, red tie, and have a blue HHS virtual background behind me. I'm joining you today from Washington, D.C., which is located on the original lands of the Anacostan people. I'm proud to serve in the Biden-Harris administration, the most diverse administration in history, an administration that has been clear from day one, from President Biden and Vice President Harris to Secretary Becerra and my boss, Admiral Rachel Levine, that health equity is a central goal to which we must strive toward. The President Biden himself has been crystal clear on his support for health equity. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health is a health promotion arm of HHS. Among other projects, it's where Healthy People 2030 lives. Healthy People 2030 defines health equity as the attainment of the highest levels of health for all people. Health equity is the goal we are all working toward. We all deserve to be able to attain the highest levels of our health. Striving toward health equity remains a core priority. It also remains an unmet dream. Working to achieve health equity will take every one of us. It will require addressing disparities in health, not just in health outcomes, but also in health access. And I'm glad to be here today on behalf of HHS to share important updates about the federal government's continued efforts to combat COVID-19. The HHS campaign, We Can Do This, is a national initiative to increase public confidence in and uptake of COVID-19 vaccines and to educate the public about the availability of COVID-19 treatments while reinforcing basic prevention measures. First, I wanna thank the team at SAGE for all of your work to support LGBTQI plus older adults every day. We have the tools to protect us thanks to many hardworking and dedicated scientists and researchers inside and outside of US government. These tools can prevent the worst effects of COVID-19, namely to reduce hospitalization and mortality. For the best protection, you need to stay up to date with your COVID-19 vaccines. And we've come a long way as a nation since the early days of COVID-19. Throughout the pandemic, we learned to care for each other, back to the days when people were making homemade face masks to donate to community organizations. Today, we know that one way to care for each other is to remind each other to stay up to date on our vaccines, both for COVID-19 and also a priority for the LGBTQI plus community for MPOX as well. There is limited data on LGBTQI plus people and vaccination rates, but what we do know is clear and irrefutable. Ours is not a population that generally struggles with vaccine hesitancy. The greater challenge for many in the LGBTQI plus population has always been access. Both the COVID-19 vaccine and the MPOX vaccine are relatively easy to access right now. And it's important to be fully vaccinated as we enter Pride season. It's so important for all of us to ensure we're up to date in our vaccines, but even more so for older adults, disabled, and immunocompromised community members. 
the vaccine can prevent the worst effects of COVID-19. The updated vaccines available now target Omicron, which is the strain of COVID-19 currently infecting people. People 65 and older can now get a second updated vaccine beginning four months after their first. So for example, if you got your COVID-19 vaccine dose between September and January, you can now get another dose to keep up your protection. And for immunocompromised people, you can get a second updated vaccine beginning two months after the first. So if you got a COVID vaccine between September and March, you can now get another one to keep up your protection. To find free COVID-19 vaccines near you, go to vaccines.gov. If you're up to date with your COVID-19 vaccine and you get infected with the virus, your immune system will quickly recognize the virus and will work to keep it from doing real harm. Additionally, I want to acknowledge that we know that many transmasculine community members have expressed concerns about access to testosterone with the end of the public health emergency. At HHS, we worked quickly and diligently with the Drug Enforcement Administration to extend the telehealth flexibilities for testosterone by six months, with a final rule expected this fall. I want to speak for a moment about MPOX, formerly referred to as monkeypox. Many of you have seen the news about a cluster of cases in Chicago. This cluster reminds us of the importance of increasing vaccination in affected communities to prevent expansion of the outbreak, and that our vaccine mission is still not complete. Nationwide, the current average daily case rate in the United States is one or fewer, over a 99% decline in daily case counts since the outbreak's peak in August 2022. We are not out of the woods yet, and unless we increase vaccination for those at risk of MPOX, we won't be out of the woods. In 2023, the administration has continued frequent, sometimes multiple times per day, engagement with stakeholders, advocates, public health departments across the nation to ensure that we do all we can to keep cases low. MPOX continues to be a public health priority for HHS and the Biden-Harris administration. Our recommendation ahead of the summer months is uh, get healthy and ready for summer 2023 by including MPOX vaccination as part of a package of sexual health services that include HIV and STI testing. Um, we need people to make sure that they receive two doses of the MPOX vaccine. Vaccines are free, safe, and effective at preventing infection, as well as the worst outcomes of MPOX. And it's never too late to get that second dose. In closing, I want to thank SAGE for the invitation to speak to you all today and for their work all year long. And I want to thank all of you for your commitment to health and well-being for LGBTQI plus older adults by participating today. We learned how to be interconnected during COVID-19, and we should maintain that spirit today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian, for your message and for the reminder you know, that vaccines are important, including MPOX. So thank you for, for being here. And I hope that you'll stick around to join us um, at the end of the program today. And I'm now honored to introduce our next speakers. We have Mark Bernanin, who is the Director of Research Evaluation at the Brookdale Center on Health and Aging, Hunter College, City University of New York, and Kim Hunt will be joining us after Mark. And Kim is the executive director of Pride Action Tank out of Chicago, Illinois. Mark, as we get started, I know that you recently published an article, Taking Charge, Social Support Dynamics Among Older Adults and Their Significant Others in COVID-19 Vaccination and Mitigation. Could you share a bit more about your findings through this research? Sure. Um... First, let me say thank you to Cheryl and Sage, uh, my colleagues at Sage, for inviting me to be part of this webinar today. Um, the whole issue of vaccine uptake among older adults, including vulnerable populations like sexual and gender minority older adults, has been a uh, concern of ours at the Brookdale Center uh, since the start of our the pandemic. Uh, Brookdale. Really, all the work we do is in service to informing health and aging policy. Um, and we do have a large research program on uh, sexual and gender minority older adults. <clears throat> However, the study I'm going to talk about today did not focus on that population. And it was really a case of we set out to look for one thing and we found 
a lot of other things that were interesting, and that's what I'd like to talk about today. So the, the basis of the study, we were working with a large uh, senior service provider in New York City, and they were interested in uh, increasing vaccine uptake in their older adult clients. Um, and at the time, in the press, we were hearing about um, high levels of vaccine hesitancy in certain groups of older adults based on race, ethnicity, and immigration status. And so we really designed the study around that. However, we we ended up finding that was really overblown, at least when it came to older adults in New York. And there were mother, another of other factors in play, um, such as immigration status, that really was more important in the end, and also the country that people had immigrated from. Um, but I, I won't be getting into those findings so much today. Um, what really emerged, if, if you heard the title of this, Taking Charge, was what we saw was that older adults weren't passive victims and uh, vulnerable helpless people during the pandemic, uh, but actually took an active role in protecting themselves and protecting others. Uh, so, you know, part of the background for this is really rooted in ageism. And from the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about how older adults were more vulnerable to COVID, and indeed they were. However, some of that was, was um, I think overblown a bit because some of the initial cases of COVID started in residential care facilities for older adults. And so that that kind of distorted the degree of risk and the degree of risk for people living in the community. Um, without question, COVID really did impact older adults. I mean, they were at greater risk, not so much for their chronological age, but for some of the chronic conditions that come along with chronological age, like uh, cardiac conditions, diabetes, uh, higher rates of obesity. Uh, so, you know, indeed they did, were more impacted by the disease. They were also impacted by a lot of the social mitigation measures, um, like the lockdowns, the isolation. Um, but we really, what we haven't really heard so much is what were older adults themselves talking about. Um, so ageism is that negative bias against people based on chronological age, and it can be manifested in a lot of ways. Um, we talk about that a lot in the context of the older LGBTQ plus community uh, because it contributes to the invisibility of that community, but it affects all older adults. Um, a lot of these ageist stereotypes have to do with older people being helpless and not contributing to society and being a drain on society. And the COVID vaccine messaging that had to do with protecting older adults and the justification of some of these social mitigation measures because of the vulnerability about older adults really kind of amplified the ageism that was going on during the pandemic. Um, it also reinforced these paternalistic attitudes we take towards older adults and them not being able to make decisions for themselves, not being able to be independent. Um, one thing we, we need to consider is that while there are some older adults who are isolated and lack social supports. Older adults' health behaviors take place in the context of their social networks and their social relationships. And that can be a two-way street. Um, family, friends, the community of older adults can influence their health behaviors for things like taking vaccination or um, engaging in social mitigation measures like isolation and masking. But just as often, older adults play an active role in influencing their community. And that's what we found in the data. So this is based on a qualitative study. We had 70 older adults who primarily um, participated in focus groups, although we had to pivot to doing individual interviews because of the Omicron wave. We were collecting data in the fall and winter of 2021 and 2022. Um, we had 
a lot of uh, ethnic diversity. We had uh, U.S. born blacks, U.S. born whites, um, West Indian Caribbean older adults, uh, Chinese speakers, um, Spanish speakers, Hispanic Latinx, and Russian speakers. So a, a total of 77. Um, and, and what did we find? One was that these social supports really encouraged vaccinations. So there was both influence from family and friend members, uh, the decisions around getting vaccinated, and uh, this included direct support for that as well as indirect guidance. Um, you know, a lot of times, and for a lot of older sexual and gender minority adults, they do have these friend-centered families of choice, but that's kind of an overgeneralization, and we have to keep in mind that many are still connected with their families. Um, they may have children, either from uh, previous or ongoing relationships. So, you know, both of these play come into play when we're talking about uh, the older sexual and gender minority population. Um, some participants were more hesitant to get vaccinated than others especially the ones who had low trust in media, government, and medical authorities. But that did not always result in a firm refusal to take the shot. Instead, a lot of these folks reached out to members of their social networks to engage in conversations and get other information, ask questions, talk things over, and assess their health risks. Um, th there's a really good quotation we have from one of our participants, um, she said, the first time I heard about it was on TV. So I said to myself, I'm not putting that in my body. I'm not doing that. So one of my nurses, my niece is a nurse, registered nurse, and she called me and she told me, you don't have to worry about it. So I said, I'll think about it. And that's what I did. I called my two sons and we did like a three-way on the phone. I don't know how to do that, but they did. They knew that technology. Um, and everybody was dying from it and everybody was getting sick and all of my nieces and nephews because um, she comes from a large family. So we all got together on the phone and, you know, we didn't want anything to happen. And so, you know, they had this group conversation around why it was important to get vaccinated and that the vaccines were actually safe. Um, there was also a lot of evaluation of the information that was out there and the misinformation that was out there. Um, and these were kind of typical concerns. One person, when they first heard about the vaccine, had mixed feelings about it because it had been developed so quickly. Um, there was a couple we interviewed who came up with this lag vaccination plan because they were concerned about side effects. So one of them got the vaccine first, and then the other one got it a couple weeks later in case one of them needed to take care of the other person. Um, and then there was this whole idea of putting COVID vaccination into the context of their life experience. And this brings up this idea of crisis competence that we talk about a lot with older LGBT adults about. This came from Doug Kimmel, who talked about how in the coming out process, um, LGBTQ people learned how to manage stress and conflict with their family, and they were able to use these skills going forward to deal with other life challenges. And this was clearly a role for most of these older adults when they talked about their past experience with vaccination and why it was important. Um, one woman talked about working in healthcare and having to get the hepatitis vaccine. So this wasn't really new ground for a lot of folks. Um, Part of the idea also was this, that there were these ideas of altruism, that it was important for people to get vaccinated, not so much for themselves, to, but to protect other members of their community and their family and friends. And that was also a motivation for them to comply with some of the uh, mask mandates and social distancing guidelines earlier in the uh, pandemic. Um, we also came up, well, one thing we found here was that these older adults served as ambassadors of altruism. So not only were they having conversations about vaccines, but they were also using these conversations to transmit some moral values about why it's important to be concerned about the welfare of others. Uh, so what did we kind of conclude from all of this? Um, one is that, you know, contrary to these ageist, 
um, narratives about older adults during the pandemic, they weren't helpless victims. They were actively taking charge of their own health and concerned about the health of their family, friends, and community, and playing a really active role in these discussions about vaccination, in the processing of all the information and misinformation that was coming out. Um, they were really actively engaged in evaluating uh, threats to their health and ways to deal with that. And then we also saw this bi-directional nature of social support. So not only were the social networks influencing older adults, but they, to the same extent, were in influencing other members in their social networks. Um, in terms of some of the recommendations, you know, one thing we didn't see initially, although this kind of changed, I think, more recently, um, but really using older adults as ambassadors around health promotion issues that affect that segment of the population. So a lot of times we see health promotion messages, they tend to use younger people, but we should really have older adults themselves if that's the community that we want to reach. And they're very effective spokespeople about uh, their health concerns and situations. Um, they're, all, they're able to bring you know, this lifetime of experience and strategies that they've used to deal with other challenges in their lives to these new situations. Um, so I think, I, I think the other thing about this is the importance of these intergenerational relationships. And so a lot of the research that I've done with sexual and gender minority older adults, a lot of them really want to give back to their communities and they want to give back to younger generations, but they seem to lack mechanisms for connecting with younger people. Um, and we really don't have a lot of good community spaces to do that. So that's something I, I would kind of um, end my remarks with of, you know, not only in the context of the COVID pandemic and the vaccination, uh, how older adults can contribute and support younger members of the community, but I think we need to think of this more generally because older adults really are a tremendous resource, and I don't think we allow them to to really flourish in that role. So I will stop there. Thank you, Mark. You. You couldn't see me because I was off camera, but I've been here shaking my head with you for the last five minutes. Um, I hope up and down and not. And yeah, no, up that. and down. <laughs> I think, you know, you're you're so right. The intergenerational support, the multi-generational support, you know, having, working with LGBTQ plus older adults to really be the ambassadors, you know, for the health messaging, I, I really think is important. Um, I, I actually have a multi-generational uh, circle and one of the 93 year old um, women in my circle, you know, she'll ask like, is it time to get our next shot? When are we gonna get our next shot? She and I actually went and got our first shots together. And so we've really supported one another, you know, through this process. Um, so thank you for that important message. And with that, I would now like to invite Kim Hunt to, to join the, the discussion here. And, and Kim, I'd like for you to really kind of reflect on, you know, what we've heard uh, from Mark and Adrian and, you know, from your work on the ground in the community, you know, what are you observing as we move forward through COVID and, you know, what are your experiences with LGBTQ plus older adults on the ground and what are you seeing? Thank you, Cheryl, and, and thank you, Mark, for your research. Um, I, I did read your paper and I really appreciate your uh, the perspective you offer around uh, the agency of LGBT or older adults in general, um, but also how ageism really perpetuates this paternalistic view of, of older adults. And I'm putting myself in that category because I turned 61 at the end of March. Um, thank you, Cheryl, so much for having me here. Pride Action Tank is uh, an ongoing partner of SAGES and so really happy to be here uh, in front of everyone to talk about this, this topic. Uh, as Cheryl mentioned earlier, I'm Kim Hunt. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I have multiple roles. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy Operations at AIDS Foundation Chicago where uh, I have three uh, main projects. One is the Getting to Zero, Ending the Epidemic Initiative, 
Uh, another is the Connection to Care Learning Collaborative, which is uh, an initiative to provide um, a cohort of Black-led, federally qualified health centers uh, to build their LGBTQ cultural responsiveness to provide HIV care and uh, prevention. And then uh, there's Pride Action Tank, where I serve as the executive director. And, and Pat, as we like to call her, is a project incubator and think tank on LGBTQ issues that's been around for about seven and a half years now. Uh, we're multi-issue and aging is certainly one of those issues that we work on. Um, years ago, we had a summit called Out Aging Summit on our possibility. And we had LGBTQ older adults at the table for both the planning, but also as participants in that two-day summit, along with service providers, educators, uh, elected officials, other policymakers, uh, and, and other folks who are interested in the topic. And some of what we learned from older adults is that they want to be uh, advocates, uh, both in their own um, healthcare journey, as well as in other programs, but also with public policy. They want places to share their stories. And as Mark pointed out, they want more intergenerational opportunities uh, to connect and not just do the brain dump, <laughs> but also to learn from, from young people and have that, that uh, bi-directional kind of sharing. Um, we were fortunate in Illinois to have ongoing, consistent messaging around COVID. Um, like many large cities or states rather, uh, both our governor and our mayor uh, had daily updates at some points in the early in the, the pandemic that kind of shared information and, and where resources could be found before vaccines and certainly after the vaccines were available. And I think we have to acknowledge the work of older uh, LGBTQ folks, uh, particularly those uh, living with HIV and AIDS at the height of the, uh, the epidemic, uh, because the work that they did in their advocacy to get drugs to the uh, it, to people as quickly as possible, uh, built the infrastructure for uh, getting a COVID vaccine or multiple vaccines out to the public as fast as, as that happened. And to Mark's point, uh, I, there wasn't a lot of hesitancy, hesitancy around taking the vaccine um, for LGBTQ folks, uh, generally speaking. But also, as Adrian said, um, we don't have much data on the impact of COVID on the LGBTQ populations. Uh, Illinois is one of a handful of states that uh, during the pandemic uh, pushed forward legislation that requires uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression data or SOGI data collection. Uh, we are in the process of implementing that new law that came into effect in 2021. Um, unfortunately, every state agency that is tasked with collecting this data has a different data collection system. Um, and so we are, are diligently as an advocacy group, uh, a coalition working with um, state agencies and others around uh, even how to ask questions. Uh, so we're hoping that whenever the next pandemic is, and we know there will be one, um, that we're able to understand what's happening with the LGBTQ uh, population. I also want to share, and this goes back to um, some of what Mark was talking about. I looked at our vaccine dashboard the other day, and of course, now that the public health emergency is over, I'm not certain that we're going to get uh, updates, but this is as of the 12th, so last Friday. Um, so in Illinois, Illinoisans as a whole, uh, about 72% have completed the primary series for uh, the COVID vaccination. 79%, uh, nearly 80% have had at least one uh, dose. But for the 65 and over population, 91% have completed the primary series with 95% having at least one dose. So I think that really speaks to the willingness of older adults to 
to do what they feel is necessary to take care of their health. I also want to talk a bit about um, AIDS Foundation Chicago's response to the, the pandemic, and that included a couple of things. First of all, amplifying local, state, and federal messaging, but using trusted community voices uh, to share that information. And I wish we had done more uh, to really tap into the, the wisdom and networks of uh, older adults, particularly in the LGBTQ community. I don't think, and Mark, you, you, you're giving me some ideas here. I don't think we did a good job of that, but generally speaking, we did recognize that um, trusted partners were key to getting messaging out. Um, we also did grand rounds uh, to help for folks who are in um, public health spaces and case managers to give them a, a perspective of what was happening. Um, and then we had started uh, an initiative with the Center on Halstead, which is the, the largest LGBTQ center in the Midwest, uh, to create what was called the Hub. And uh, the Hub is a one-stop shop for resources for folks who are, are living with HIV and AIDS. And then um, just before the pandemic, we started a new initiative focused on older adults and uh, long-term survivors um, who are living with HIV and AIDS called Care Plus. And for the hub, we saw that um, services rendered went up between 2020 and 2022, uh, almost doubled. So in 2020, when we first got started, there were 1,300 um, services rendered. Top three were like housing services, case management, and, and food. We saw throughout the pandemic that um, food assistance was huge. 2021, we had about 2,200 folks, um, our services rendered, case management, housing, emergency financial assistance were the top three. And then in 2022, we had about 2,300 uh, services rendered in case management, housing, and then employment services were significant there. And I should point out that about 50% of the 6,000 or so uh, folks who receive case management services through the network that uh, AFC helps coordinate. Um, uh, there's about 6,000 folks who are um, uh, clients in that network. For our Care Plus program for senior services, uh, which is a new program, there are about 40 to 45 folks uh, across the three years. 99% of them are vaccinated. And some of the COVID-related services that they received were uh, rental and utility assistance, mental health services, food assistance, transportation and employment. And the, one of the case managers uh, in that program shared with me that there was a lot of social isolation among um, folks in her um, caseload. And she did uh, quite a few house visits initially with protective gear, um, and then as uh, restrictions relaxed, um, less so. But she continues to do those because of the isolation. And largely, these are folks living with HIV and AIDS. So there's the stigma of that that they've endured over decades in some cases. And so it's really shrunk their, their networks. For Pride Action Tank in particular, we were about to launch a, an initiative focused on um, bringing awareness to the presence and the needs of LGBTQ older adults in long-term care facilities. And then just before we launched, we went on lockdown. So we had to move all of our programming to virtual like everybody else. And we uh, reconfigured what we were gonna do to focus on training. Uh, storytelling trainings, uh, advocacy trainings, uh, ally trainings for folks who have an LGBTQ older adult in their, uh, who they are caring for or looking out for, and then public policy. Um, we did quite a few or continue to do a lot of public policy initiatives uh, that are focused on uh, LGBTQ older adults in particular. As we have moved through the pandemic um, over time, we are seeing that folks are starting to get out. Uh, there was a trickle last year. I think that is growing quite a bit. Um, you know, folks have their home tests. Um, 
Venues don't require proof of vaccination anymore. Masks are optional, uh, though I will say among the older adults that, that I see in our programming and that of our um, partnering organizations, we do see quite a few people continuing to wear masks. Um, and then there are just more in-person events. Uh, Pride, uh, the Pride Parade was in person again last year, uh, although we know that that is, Pride Parades are not always the best venue for older adults, but it's a signal that, that things are getting back to our new normal, whatever that is. And even with, with uh, Pride Action Tank, we're starting to do more in-person events. Although I think the pandemic has taught us the value of having hybrid events, uh, we were able to reach way more people with our virtual events, of course, than we could with our in-person events. Um, so, you know, we were able to connect with folks from all over the state, for example, and, and now we're hoping to actually do in-person events in other parts of, of our state as our partnerships have grown. Um, and then there's COVID fatigue. We know that COVID is still with us, um, but it is less top of mind, uh, largely because, you know, so many folks are vaccinated. So when folks are getting um, uh, COVID, uh, the symptoms are not nearly what they were earlier in the pandemic. Um, so folks are, but folks are less, talking about COVID less and less um, as, as time has gone on. And uh, there's a little bit of a resistance to, you know, even bring COVID up at this point, uh, even though we know it's still with us. So I think we're in our new normal in terms of what I'm seeing with the community. Uh, there are folks who are um, still having their first in-person events. I just traveled with someone recently um, who's with one of our programs and we were going downstate and this was his first time um, going to um, an event outside of the, the apartment complex that he lives in. So I think we still need to be sensitive to um, the anxiety that a lot of people are still experiencing as they step out into the world again and we begin to, to, to do things in person. So that's kind of what's happening here in Chicago. <laughs> Thank you, Kim, so much for, for sharing your perspective and, and just all the wise wisdom that you always bring to us when we, we ask you to speak with us. Uh, I'd now like to offer the opportunity for Mark and Adrian to join us again on screen. And, you know, I think both Kim and Mark brought up, I think, very powerful opportunities for us to really reflect on where we've been and, and where we're going in the future. And a couple of things that, that really stood out to me was this opportunity to think about how we engage older adults as health promoters and ambassadors. And, you know, what can we learn as a community, you know, to, to prepare? Because we've had an opportunity really three years to learn and to develop a better understanding about where we are as a community. So how do we bring some of these learnings forward, you know, into what may be next for us as a community? So just welcome any of you to, to jump in and share any, any thoughts that you have right now. Well, I think a good start would be to actually engage the older adults themselves and say, how could we make this work? make the, you know, do this in a very collaborative way. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, particularly some of us in academia, we, you know, sit in our offices and we cook up all these great ideas and then we want to roll them out to the community and they land with a thud. Um, I think, you know, if we really are sincere about wanting to, um, make older adults part of this process and collaborate with them that we need to develop how we would use them as in health promotion and um, as health ambassadors and let them take part in the design of that and what it might look like. I think the, the ideas that they'll come up with, um, the opportunities that they'll identify are probably much more rich and vast than, you know, we could sit around a table and plan. 
So that's that's where I would start. I would add that um, I think that one thing that COVID, especially the, the beginning of COVID, the first three to six months of COVID taught so many of us is that it's really important to take our health in our own hands and to think about for just for ourselves, not even at the population level, on an individual level, um, what actions we can take to keep our own bodies safe. And that includes, um, you know, everything from an annual physical to, uh, you know, a flu shot to COVID and MPOX vaccines, to HIV testing, um, to routine cancer screenings, um, that, that we really need, quitting smoking, we really need to, to do the things that are that all together when we do all of them, they they lead us to healthier lives, and um, and I think that we really learned that especially at the beginning of COVID, um, and it's a lesson that we should take with us uh, as um, you know COVID is still here, but as as we kind of move into the future, we should take that lesson with us that no one will be a better advocate for our individual body than ourselves, and that we can we can we can do those actions uh, pretty simply and easily um, as we're also working on like the broader population challenges. Yeah, I totally agree with Adrian and Mark and just um, want to pick up on something that Mark talked about earlier is just ageism and just this recognition that if we're lucky, we're all aging, right? And that, <laughs> and that we have to stop referring to other to older adults as others and really make sure that we are being inclusive in our in our in our comments and our thinking and our policy around this continuum, this age continuum that we're we're all in. And I think that is where some of our messaging lands with a thud, right? Because we're talking about them instead of us. And we have to do more us language. Um, so totally agree with Adrian and, and Mark on, on all the other parts. Yeah, I, I completely agree, um, you know, with what all, all three of you are saying. And, you know, I'd be happy to continue this conversation, you know, as a part of our work at SAGE, uh, you know, just how we can, can lift up, you know, some of the lessons learned. And, and really care, carry these messages forward. Um, we have about 15 minutes left and just wanted to see if you all had any other comments, things that you weren't able to share or questions for one another. Uh, so um, while we're waiting to see if any other questions come in, if I could just add one other, yeah, one other please thing do. what I was saying before, which is that, you know, in addition to kind of taking action for our own bodies, what we've learned is that these actions also uh, protect us from some of the worst effects of COVID too, right? So like, we learned that um, we learned that smokers have worse effects of COVID than non-smokers, for example, right? Um, so uh, at a time when we are um, at a time when we're not uh, uh, sick with COVID or other uh, viruses, uh, that those are good times to take positive actions for for our health. Well, and that includes making sure we're up to date in our vaccines too. Right, so we can do all of these things at the same time. You can actually get, um, you know, talk to your vaccinators, but you can get uh, MPOX and COVID vaccines simultaneously in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases. So um, those are like conversations to talk with with your vaccinator about um, at the time of the vaccination. And a lot of LGBTQI plus people don't have a primary care doctor. So that's usually the person in our lives who encourages us to get the vaccines that we need on the schedule that, that's recommended by the government. Um, so if you're someone who's listening who doesn't have a primary care doctor that, who you trust, um, there's, there, there is information on the CDC website that outlines when it's appropriate to get each vaccine. Um, and there's places where you can go to get the vaccine even without having a doctor. Uh, who you consider your primary care doctor. Um, if if it's not, if it doesn't feel right for you at this moment to go find a doctor, you can still go find the vaccine. Um, and we want to encourage that. We also want to encourage finding a doctor you trust. But if but if that's not the right time for that, th there's other ways to get the vaccine. So wanting to encourage that as well. Definitely. Thank you, Adrian. Mark and Kim, do either of you have any additional comments that you want to add today? 
Well, I, I think something else that came out of the, the larger study <clears throat> um, when we're talking about health promotion in older adults is we really heard that people want simple, direct, clear messaging about what they need to do and what's important. Like, I think what Adrian shared today, he's been very clear, he's been very direct, unambiguous. That's the kind of messaging we need around health promotion. Um, it, it, most, you know, most older people still have trust in traditional sources of information, um, like their healthcare providers, like uh, government, um, and and I think if if there's a better way of coordinating that messaging, um, that would be good. Um, I think when it came to to MPOX, um, I think there were some lessons learned from COVID, and the messaging around that was much more clear and um, un unambiguous. And and I think to Adrian's point, um, the you know gay and bisexual men who were largely affected by MPOX did take responsibility for their own health and their own well-being um, and were really, you know, seeking out vaccination and trying to protect themselves. Um, and now there's been some recent evidence that um, some sexual activity was curtailed or uh, reduced a little bit during the height of MPOX because we found out that was a primary way of transmission. Um, that I, I think this will resonate with Kim too, but when I do work with HIV and sexual health, the message I'm always trying to get out is you need to take control of your own sexual health. You can't leave that responsibility to other people. But I, I agree, I think that generalizes um, to all aspects of our lives. Yeah, for sure. And I think we have to recognize, you know, our. Um, the challenges of some of our, our public health um, initiatives in, in reaching all the people who need to be reached, because we did have some issues uh, around MPOX in Chicago with uh, messaging not getting to communities of color and, and initially vaccines not getting uh, in those communities. Things have gotten better for sure, and there's a lot happening this summer, trust and believe, as we get ready to kick off Pride, um, there's going to be a lot, a lot of uh, vaccines offered of uh, COVID and boosters and um, MPOX. And, you know, in Chicago and probably other cities too, we've been meeting, our public health department has been meeting weekly since August of last year um, to talk about how to do better and how to get messaging out around, around MPOX. Uh, and, and Mark, I just want to reiterate uh, what you were saying about older adults and having them at the table, too. Uh, when we did the Out Aging Summit, we had older LGBTQ older adults do that planning with us. And as we have gone through our report and uh, implemented the ideas that folks had, LGBTQ older adults continue to be at the table. And so when we do something when we have an initiative, it doesn't land with a thud, to your point, because the folks who are most impacted um, by what we're trying to do uh, are at the table planning uh, and, and moving alongside with us. And, and we're, we're listening to them. We're being led. Why am I saying them? I'm 61. We're being led by us. <laughs> It's always a good reminder, Kim, isn't it? You know, I I now say I'm Sage Age. You know, we're we we are part of us, right? <laughs> so, you know, I also wanted to share that uh, for folks that are looking for resources, whether it's you know COVID vaccines, Mpox vaccines, meal delivery services, whatever it may be you know, please feel free to reach out to the Sage LGBTQ plus elder hotline at 1-877-360-5428. And this will connect you with our, our hotline that will be able to help direct people to local services in your community um, for what really whatever type of service that you may be looking for. This is in partnership with United Way Worldwide. So they're connected with all the 211 centers across the country as well. 
Cheryl, I think like maybe like one underlying final point from HHS that I would just make is that, especially as we're getting close to Pride season, and uh, and I love Pride season, and so many of you do too, I'm sure, uh, that as we're getting close to Pride season, that you know, staying up to date on your COVID vaccines, protecting yourself from MPOX with vaccines, this is self care and this is community care all at the same time. So this is a great way to show love and care for the broader LGBTQI plus community and for yourself. Um, and uh, I, I think that would be the like the underlined message. If you're not doing it for your, do it for yourself. If you're not doing it for yourself, do it for your community. Thank you, Adrian. That is perfect. Mark, Kim, do either of you have a closing message? What Adrian said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with that, do it for yourself and do it for your community. I think that's our, our closing message. And just want to thank everybody again for joining us today. This recording will be available on the, the Sage COVID website. And if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much.